As a place of brutal hangings and horrific living conditions, it's no surprise that the National Justice Museum is home to a multiple negative entities that have actually attacked visitors. Come and sit by me as we are getting into hundreds of years of dark history, brutal crimes and their punishments, and of course, all of the terrifying ghostly goings on that will keep you up all night. Ask me how I know. Hey friend, how is your day been today? Are you doing good? Are you staying hydrated? I know you haven't drank your water, go and get some water. I'm telling you, you'll feel better. If you're new around here, hello, welcome, hi. My name is Claire and I'm a lover of all things morbid, mysterious and macabre. I have spent hours and hours absolutely enthralled in ghost hunting TV shows, YouTube paranormal investigations, all of that, I love it. But you know what I love more than night vision cameras and EVPs? I love the history behind a paranormal encounter, the origins of urban legends, and the real, raw, personal ghost stories that people have experienced firsthand. So that is what we're gonna do. Every week we sit down and swap ghost stories like a good old sleepover. So if that is your scene, I would mm, I highly recommend subscribing so that you'd never miss one of our chats. Like it's all spooky shit like this. Why wouldn't you love this? Sources for today come from the National Justice Museum themselves. They have honestly got some absolutely brilliant guides who are so knowledgeable and they do absolutely fantastic tours there as well. I also took information from the books Murder and Crime in Nottingham by Adam Nightingale, Old Nottinghamshire Punishments by Ian Morgan and Haunted Nottingham by Andrew James Wright. And all of these books, they're like absolutely brilliant. I've actually, I've actually got them here because I remembered to bring them in with me. Look at that all of them. And so obviously the haunted books, like these are all really great for like all of the ghost stories. And this one had some really specific examples from the National Justice Museum itself. So that was great. Old Nottinghamshire. I just dropped that on the floor. Old Nottinghamshire punishments. This one was good if you are interested in Nottingham history in particular. Was that a disembodied head? Severed. That is a severed head. The severed head of Jeremiah Bandreth is in this book. So if you want to see that, I'm going to go posting gore on YouTube. And Murder and Crime in Nottingham, this one, oh my god, this one, right. It's very good and I didn't see it when I was like book shopping online. It was only because I went into Nottingham Waterstones that I found this book and it helped fill in quite a few details about a certain prisoner. I'm just gonna leave it there. This is another story with a lot of dark history to it. So a strap in, cause we are getting into the details today. We're getting right on in there. So the National Justice Museum was formerly known as the Galleries of Justice and it sits in the city of Nottingham and has been a vital part of crime and punishment in the city for literally hundreds of years. As far back as the Norman times, which was between 1066 and 1154, a Shire Hall has actually stood on that site. And a Shire Hall like basically was just like a town hall back then. It would have been like the hub for the local government to get together and do all their governmenty bits. It also went by the name Sheriff Sheriff Hall, County Hall or King's Hall and it's just where the sheriffs of Nottingham would have been based. So these sheriffs they would have been the ones going around collecting the taxes and like basically policing the community. It first appeared in written records as a court of law in 1375 and we know from the records that there has actually been a prison there since 1449. And a prison in the 15th century? Yeah, it's just as miserable as it sounds. This sheriff's dungeon was lovingly known as the pits as that's literally what they were. They were just a pit dug into the sandstone below the jail. Like we're talking no toilet, no bed, just a bit of hay and plenty of rats to keep you company or infect you with diseases. Prisoners could spend months in these holes underground waiting for their trial or if they were like sentenced to transportation, waiting for their prisoner ship to sail to the godforsaken wilderness that was Australia. If rotting away for months on end in a dark, disgusting pit wasn't bad enough, there was actually a hole in the ground that was even worse because the Nottingham County Jail also had its very own oubliette. And if you don't know what an oubliette is, its name translates from French meaning to forget because that's exactly what happened to prisoners that were thrown down there. They were forgotten about. There was only one hole in or out that led to the dungeon which sat about 20 meters below the street level outside. And if you were thrown into the oubliette, you would basically just be left to starve to death. You would never see the light of day again. Like you would literally just be thrown in this hole. You'd probably break a bone or two on the way down as well. And 
you know it's bad when you would just be praying to break your neck so that at least the whole ordeal would be over quickly. But if you didn't, you were in for a horrific death. Because you're that far below the ground, there is no outside noise. Like the atmosphere down there is so heavy and thick because all you can hear is the sound of your own breath in that damp, cold, dark dungeon that you knew would eventually become your tomb. Like you were not surviving this, you were gonna die in that tiny little oubliette. And I think that's just 100% a way worse way to go than getting straight up executed. Like, you're just waiting for the inevitable at that point. Like, you're just waiting for your body to just give out. Like, that is brutal. And because this is what made Nottingham's County Jail so special, barbaric. Barbaric is a better word than special. If you're not familiar with Nottingham, it's a city that is built on like a network of man-made caves that are literally dug out of the sandstone. So it's not just the jail that had these like sandstone pits. Loads of buildings use the caves as their cellars. And like, if you go around Nottingham, there's loads of restaurants and bars that either like store their alcohol down there or they can actually use the caves to like host visitors. Like some places you can actually like go and sit in the caves and have your meal or whatever. And you can even go down into this city of caves because some of the network has been opened up to the public for like guided tours and stuff. But literally like, they're just everywhere. Like we were at the Haunted Museum in Nottingham earlier this year and they'd not long moved into their new place. And when they moved in, they were told that there was a cupboard under the stairs. That, like, obviously like you can use the cupboard under the stairs. They noticed it looked a little odd. And so they started digging and that's when they rediscovered this cave right under their building that had been filled in. And we may have to revisit the caves in a later episode as like apparently anything in the UK, it is rumored to be haunted as hell. And so if you were found guilty of whatever crime you had committed in the courthouse above the jail, you would have literally been sent down the stairs out of the dock into the underground prison to await your fate. It was the only place in England where you could be jailed, tried, imprisoned, and then executed all without ever leaving the property. You got another one-stop justice shop going on. But the building that you can walk through today isn't entirely the same as what it was way back then. Both the courthouse and the jail have been added to and enlarged over the years, but it wasn't particularly well looked after during the 18th century. In March 1724, the Shire Hall had reached such a state of neglect that one Monday morning, the floor collapsed and a crowd of people that had assembled at court that day fell through into the cellars below. This caused an absolute scene in the hall with everyone going into a panic, like naturally, you just fell through the floor. People were scared the entire hall was gonna fall down around them, others were scared of a fire, and several people actually jumped out of the windows to get away from whatever was going on. The judge, Sir Littleton Powys, was absolutely terrified and was recorded to cry out, a plot, a plot, because he thought that the floor, like, just collapsing, was gunshots and that someone had come to assassinate him. But as the men picked themselves up and dusted themselves off, they realized that it was just because the building that they were conducting this also important business in hadn't been properly looked after. So they went back to the business of the day, along with making the decision that they should probably rebuild the Shire Hall. Luckily, no one was killed during that incident, but one really unlucky guy cut his leg right down to the bone, which I mean, like it's 1724, like that could have been a death sentence. I don't know. I don't know if he died or not. It still took until 1769, almost 50 years to start construction on the new Shire Hall. When it was finished in 1772, it was a gorgeous looking building, but it still had reminders of exactly what it was used for. Out front, there was this really high like iron palisade that was put up to help control the crowds that got a bit unruly on execution day. During the early 19th century, the Shire Hall was expanded again with changes made to one of the courtrooms as well as extra rooms added for the judge to retire to and the court clerk's office and a robing room for the barristers. And we're like really getting into the glory days of the prison now. Like the Georgians, they really knew how how to make a miserable time even worse. Like no joke, the Nottingham County Jail was described as hell on earth and was even known as one of the worst prisons in the country. So if you were sent here, just like the criminals that had come in the years before you, you were not in for a good time. It was poorly designed, poorly ran, and had an absolutely foul odor of rotting bodies and shit. 
Like genuinely, one time a corpse was left to rot in the infirmary because they didn't have a proper place to store the dead bodies. But don't don't worry, if you died in the prison, you weren't always just left to rot. Sometimes you'd be carried up to the courtroom and dissected for medical research in the exact room where you had been found guilty and sentenced. So it's not all bad, I mean, you get to be cut up in front of people. And even with this reputation, most of the prisoners weren't actually on like a Shawshank type deal. The county jail was only used to house you from the time of your arrest until the time of your trial, and then until your sentence had been carried out. So there weren't any like prisoners serving life in prison or anything like that that you'd like get today. Because I know, it was much worse. Because the thing about prisons back then is that they weren't just there to take away your liberty. They were there to punish you. If you do bad things, bad things are gonna happen to you kind of thing. If you were found guilty of something petty, like stealing a loaf of bread or being a troublesome woman, you'd be sentenced to humiliation. And this could be anything from like getting whipped in the market square to getting rotten vegetables and dog poo thrown at you by all of your friends and neighbors. But for the higher level crimes like murder, then yeah, you'd suffer. If you weren't sentenced to publicly hang, you'd be forcibly exiled to Australia, never to see your family again. Because while only some convicts were sentenced to transportation for life, like they were exiled like forever, do not come back, most of them were only sentenced for like a few years. So you could in theory come back. The problem was you had to pay to make your own way back once your sentence had been served. So many like just never returned. There were also debtors held at the county jail which is just a whole issue in itself and just adds to the absolute misery that this building saw because as their name suggests debtors owed money so they'd be imprisoned until they had worked off their debt which could be years the twisted part of all of this they had to pay to be imprisoned i know so you had to pay seven shillings a week just to be in prison and get fed by the jailer. But if you wanted to live in not completely subhuman conditions and have a bed to sleep in and your own bucket and oh, even a window, yeah, that was gonna cost you extra. So the poorest of the poor debtors would have been living in absolutely miserable conditions. And it was corrupt, naturally, because these jailers, they were actually prisoners that had taken the job of being a jailer to work off their own debt. So I guess you could say they weren't in the best frame of mind to be managing and looking after prisoners. Like they were in there because they owed money. So they were gonna make damn sure that they got as much money as possible out of you. And then they could still choose to make your life hell if they didn't like you because what are you gonna do? Write a strongly worded letter to the man in charge? Yeah, I don't think so, sunshine. I bet you can't even read. So if you survived the awful conditions, somehow managed to work off your debt, and if you were up to date with your prison rent, you only had one final hurdle to freedom. You obviously had to pay to be released. But that wasn't even the extent of the nastiness that inmates would go through while they were imprisoned. Because in the 1800s, the prison was like many in the country and they had this thing called the silent and separate system. So this basically meant that you would stay silent and you would be separated from all of the other inmates. You were locked up in the county jail cells for 23 hours a day with one hour for exercise in the exercise yard. But you'd still like have this mask on so that you couldn't communicate with anyone. Even eye contact wasn't allowed, so they'd better not catch you glimpsing at someone else or you'd be in for a world of pain. Because human beings are not designed to be isolated, being completely cut off from contact, even when there are people around you. So a lot of them, unsurprisingly, became super depressed and probably would have attempted suicide in those cells. And just because you were a woman did not mean that they would let you off easy. The Victorians added the laundry room to the county jail and it would basically like be the women's section. Women were usually in for like petty crimes, like a bit of theft or whatnot, but you'd still be in absolutely horrific conditions. You'd be stripped off, fumigated and shaved, and then you'd start hard labor of cleaning the prisoner's sheets for eight hours a day in sweaty, humid, disgusting conditions and think you'd get a free pass just because you were eight months pregnant. Absolutely not, get to work. At least so if you were imprisoned in the late 1800s, you could expect slightly more fair treatment by prison staff because it was at this point where they hired actual professionals to watch over prisoners instead of corrupt jailers. So wardens would have looked after the men and matrons would have been in charge of the women. 
And fun fact, the wardens and matrons were usually like a husband and wife team and they would have lived in the prison, actually in the governor's house, like above the laundry room. Oh, so cute, little family business. But even so, don't you dare think about misbehaving. Because the county jail had what was called dark cells, which were solitary confinement cells basically. And they were pitch black and used as punishment. Prisoners who broke the rules and were generally a nuisance would be put into this tiny, damp, pitch black room for usually a day or two, but it could have been up to a week on a diet of bread and water. And I cannot even describe to you how dark they were down there. I mean, obviously I'm pretty sure you have a good idea. They were called dark cells, but you know. I tried to get a picture with a flash on just so that you can see sort of like the space that you're working with, but it was just so dark that it didn't even work. I was back down there again in September and they had like had all of the lights off. So I went and stood in this cell and turned the torch off and it is, it's just black, like you can't see your hands in front of your face, like there is just nothing. And being left in that for up to a week, like with the smell, the disease, the fear, just all being left to marinate in the dark with your own emotions like that, like, I mean, seriously, no wonder this place is haunted, you know? And while I'm talking about all of this history that happened hundreds of years ago, and you can try and recreate it by like switching all the lights off and contemplating in the darkness, but it's still really easy to feel like quite detached from what really went on there. Like I can tell you the stories now and you can go to the place and you can like read all the placards that are on the walls and stuff, but it's hard to put yourself in those shoes. Like what people really went through in this hellhole. But there is something in the county jail that even today brings home that these were real people being put to death or just left to survive in these horrific conditions. Walking through the exercise yard, you can still see today etched onto the wall the names of previous prisoners and some were accompanied by the names of the crimes that they were found guilty of. And there were even tally marks on the walls too. Like these would have been from prisoners like counting down the days until their trial or if it was after their trial, they were counting down their last days before their sentence is carried out. It really gives a small insight into that mental torture that some people went through. Like knowing that they were gonna die soon, others knowing that they were probably gonna be found guilty and was gonna be sentenced to die or transported away from their families. It really goes some way to bringing home those stories of brutality that went on in the justice system. And relatively not that long ago either. One of the guys that we spoke to while we were there really put it into perspective in that if you were a baby that attended the last public execution in England, because it was a fun day out for all the family, which was 1868, you would have been 86 years old when Elvis Presley released his first record in 1954. There could have been some people at the last public execution listening to Elvis Presley. Like that, that's, that's the timeline we're working with here. And some of the names on the wall have actually been matched up to the records so that we know the convicts behind these etched names. And of course their punishments. Like seriously, how cool is that? I mean, I guess it is pretty dark when you think about it though. Like some of these men would have had their names engraved onto the wall knowing full well that they're never gonna see the outside world again until it's time for them to meet the hangman. But up until 1817, most of the public hangings in Nottingham took place over at Gallows Hill, which would have been about where the gates to the church cemetery or rock cemetery as it's also known, uh, at the top of Mansfield Road. After this, public executions were held right outside the county jail because it's much more convenient and gives less of a chance of prisoners to escape. The scaffold was built over the stone steps in front of the main doorway, so the drop would have been in line with the top of the doorway. Because obviously you've got to give these spectators a good view, like they've come for a show, they're expecting a show, you know? And it really was a great spectacle. 10 to 12,000 people would cram onto high pavement the street just outside the jail. And it was fun for all the family. Everyone from the baby right through to grandma would show up to watch the condemned swing. They'd get dressed in all their finery, they'd get absolutely blasted on gin, which is pretty hardcore as a lot of these executions would have taken place at eight in the morning. One of the unfortunates that was hanged was a guy called George Hearson, and he's one of the names that you can actually see etched into the wall of the exercise yard. So a bit of backstory on what happened before George was picked up. In 1831, the common man didn't yet have the right to vote, but people were working to change that. The second reform bill of the year was passed through the House of Commons, which is made up of elected members of parliament. So they'd passed it through, they were like, yep, yeah, let's give the common man the right to vote. The problem was, 
that it also needed to pass through the House of Lords. And this is made up of peers. So people like dukes, earls, barons, and the such. Like these are very high up people in England. Like these men already hold all the power. What good was it gonna do to them to give the poor peasants any say? Heavens no. So they turned down the reform bill and brought about what some consider to be the closest thing that England has ever come to a revolution. There was rioting and arson in loads of major towns, including Nottingham. Buildings were set fire to, including Nottingham Castle and a silk mill in Beeston. People were arrested for these attacks and three were sentenced to hang for what they did. Amongst them was our boy, George Hearson. On the 1st of February, 1832, along with two other condemned, 22 year old George took his last few steps onto the gallows before being taken out of this world by the noose. So now if you look on the walls in the exercise yard you'll find an etching for George and it says his name and then for rioting which is what he was executed for. In all 10 people were executed on the steps of the Shire Hall and one behind closed doors after which they were buried in the prisoners exercise yard just behind the building as they couldn't be buried on hallowed ground in a churchyard. Their bodies were buried in pits of quicklime to speed up decomposition and they still remain there to this day, entombed under the stones of the exercise yard. Which is exactly where you'll see the surviving gravestones of some of the prisoners that were executed and buried there. Including one William Saville. Oh boy! This guy! This guy. In life, he was what you can pretty safely call a not very nice man. He was born in 1815 and made a living as a framework knitter, which is kind of like an operator of a mechanical knitting machine, so it was fairly semi-skilled for the time. When the young William was in his 20s, he met an older woman who was unmarried and already had an illegitimate child. Her name was Anne Ward. And this, this is just where he shows what a great guy he is. William and Anne start sleeping together when what happens? Anne gets pregnant. She isn't going through another pregnancy unmarried. She can't have another illegitimate child. Like it's not happening. But Will, he's in his 20s, he's making money, he doesn't want to be tied down to this older woman who already has a kid that isn't his. That is not the life he wants. Probably should have thought of that then, William. But Anne has a sister that's looking out for her and pretty much bribes William with money to marry Anne. So he does. Just like any fairy tale that starts with the groom being bribed into marriage, the husband and wife were not happy together. Somehow though, I mean, you know exactly how, but you know what I mean. They went on to have two more children together. After nine years of a pretty miserable marriage, William decided that he'd had enough, and in January 1844, he just walked out on his entire family. Just opened the door and walked away. With no income, Anne and the kids were forced into the poorhouse and were just struggling to get by. William, on the other hand, picked up right where he'd left off before meeting Anne. He'd met a younger woman and the pair were planning to emigrate to America to get married. Oh, how cute. That was until Anne tracked him down and shamed him into coming back to provide for his family. Because of course he hadn't told this new woman that he was already married. Yeah, missed out that small detail. But Will had had a taste of what his life could have been like if he wasn't tied down to this family. So on the 31st of May, 1844, he suggested that the family go for a little walk in the woods. Right, let's go and see if we can talk this out. Let's, let's just go for a nice walk in a secluded private area. Eyewitness records of the time claim that the entire Savile family were seen walking at about 12.25 in the afternoon. And at 12.30, five minutes later, William was witnessed walking away, completely alone. In the space of five minutes, he had used his cutthroat razor to slit the throats of his wife and three children. He'd left them out in the forest and arranged the bodies in a way to make it look like Anne had killed the kids and then herself. But that wasn't flying with the authorities. Like they immediately knew. Who is suspect number one in crimes like these? It's the spouse. It's always the spouse. And double always the spouse when the spouse has a bit on the side. Two hours after he'd wiped out his family, William was arrested and charged with their murders. I mean, really, like, that was only gonna go one way. But those wouldn't be the only deaths tied to him. And that's why William's story is infamous in Nottingham. Because on the day of his execution, on the 7th of August, 1844, as the thousands of people gathered to watch him die, something happens. 
According to reports of the time, as William choked to death on the end of a noose, the people at the front of the crowd recoiled in horror, while the people at the back of the crowd pushed forward to get a better look. And this street that people were standing in, it's not huge, and there's thousands of people there. With this movement, the crowd started to get a bit panicky, and realising there was nowhere for them to go, all hell just broke loose. The pressure of the crowd was so big, there were so many people pushed in, that the force broke down the front door of a nearby surgeon's house. As the door broke open, spectators just like spilled into his hallway, and bless him, he immediately got to work like treating all of their injuries. But others would not be so lucky. 17 people, mostly children, were trampled and crushed to death in the crowd. 12 died immediately and another 5 died of their injuries afterwards. With all that death tied to him, it's no wonder that he's mentioned a bit later on too. The last man to be executed on the steps was a Richard Thomas Parker in 1864. After getting into an argument with his dad, he'd grabbed a gun and shot both of his parents in cold blood. His father would survive the injuries, but unfortunately his mother was not so lucky. After that, the country had kind of moved on a little bit. They started to get a little bit of a bad taste in their mouths about people being killed, just out in the open, and so executions had started to be carried out in private. The last man to be executed in the prison was the only one that was hanged behind closed doors, and oh my god, this story. His execution took place in 1877 in a yard that like used to be part of the jail, but it's now a car park. Maybe a blessing, I guess, depends how you look at it, but he was also the first man in Nottinghamshire to be executed with a long drop. And this was where the drop from the gallows was long enough to like break your neck and you would die instantly, instead of the slow and agonizing suffocation that the prisoners before him had suffered. But it wasn't so great. The psychological torture that the executioners put this poor guy through really made up for it. Some really great top-notch work done here, lads. They'd built the scaffold, but they'd forgotten to put the drop in. Instead of wasting time getting their own hands dirty, they handed the prisoner a shovel and told him to dig a seven foot hole in the ground for him to drop into. I mean, like, what do you even do at that point? Like, if you refuse, you're gonna die anyway, so why not make sure that the drop is long enough for you to be out of your misery sooner? Still, pretty messed up. But, <laughs> but wait, it gets worse. Once he'd finished digging the hole, the hangmen made the condemned man stand next to the hole and told him to jump in. Couldn't even do the courtesy of pushing him. Basically just made him kill himself. Like, there you go, there's the hole that you just dug for the last few hours, now jump in it while you've got a noose around your neck. What the hell? Not done though. We're not done. So you know how this execution was supposed to be done behind closed doors, public executions were abolished, you can't do that anymore. Well, there were some builders working nearby. So they'd put tarpaulins up around the makeshift gallows and the builders carried on working around them while this guy was basically just forced to kill himself. I'm gonna need a moment. What the actual hell? And I feel like this story, it just really sums up how little of a flying one these people cared about the convicts. I mean, they were murderers and rapists, like, let's not get away from that fact. But also, to make someone kill themselves like that, like, that's not cool, man. A few months later, the whole jail was closed down. In the final four months of the hellhole, as the Victorians called it, prisoners had been thrown into the dark cells 67 times, food had been withheld 53 times, and one unfortunate prisoner had received a whipping. But that wasn't the end of the entire building though. Oh no, we're still going. There's still history to be learned. Trials continued to be held in the courts and in 1905, a police station was built next door. In 1954, the county council moved out of the Shire Hall, but the building was still used for civil and criminal courts until the Crown Court on Canal Street was built and took over in 1991. After the last trial was held at Shire Hall, the clock was stopped at 11.15 a.m. in the courtroom and it was never restarted. In 1995, the Galleries of Justice Museum opened up in the building and then it was refurbished and rebranded in 2017 into the National Justice Museum. And now you can just walk through the building that was once home to absolute misery, if that's your kind of thing. Their collection keeps growing too, they've even got pieces from Wandsworth Prison, including the original trapdoors from their gallows. Like these were the actual trapdoors that condemned prisoners would have stood on just before they dropped. So if you have the chance to go to Nottingham and visit the National Justice Museum, I would highly recommend it. It is an absolutely brilliant place. The staff members are amazing too, they are so knowledgeable. It is just a brilliant place. 10 out of 10, would recommend. 
So obviously with such a long history concentrating around one of the most brutal parts of living in the old days, imprisonment and execution, and with literal bodies still buried on the grounds, I'm sure you're not in the least bit surprised to learn that this place is haunted as hell. And the paranormal activity starts from as soon as you walk through the main doors of the building. There have been reports of three separate apparitions seen in the entrance hall, including a soldier, an older woman, and an upper class Victorian gentleman wearing all of his finery. Perhaps the most famous entity that calls this place home is the spirit of one of those condemned that were hung outside the front steps, William Savile. He appears as a tall shadow figure and apparently has a pungent aroma to him. People that have experienced his negative presence also report feeling like an intense feeling of someone watching them, making them feel incredibly uneasy and unwelcome. He seemed to really take a shine to one staff member of the museum, or maybe he really hated her. She refused to lock up on her own at closing time, as every time she did, she felt like this really intense evil presence right behind her shoulder, following her everywhere and just watching her every move. And I mean, yeah, having your boss watching over your shoulder is one thing, but when it's like a really negative entity, like, yeah, I'd probably not be keen on working on my own either. The courtroom is also a particularly active spot. The balconies that once gave the wealthy a place to come and watch an exciting day of the riffraff being sentenced to death has now become home to dark shadows. They can be seen darting in between the pillars and watching your every move. There's one cleaner who refuses to work in the courtroom alone now as on multiple occasions, she's seen a tall dark figure pacing back and forth up on the balcony. One evening, another cleaner was hoovering the floor in the courtroom when apparently she she felt something brush past her and like whatever it was, she felt it was real. So she just assumed it was like another cleaner or a member of staff trying to get past, like just another human. So she did what anyone would do, right? Like she just looked up like to see who it was, to see like how she could move out of the way so that they could get past. But when she did, she realized that there was not another living soul in that courtroom with her. Disembodied groans and screams have been heard in the courtroom with some seeming to like come from the stairs near the dock leading down to the cells. Which I mean, you can imagine that back in the day, like that wouldn't have been an unusual sound to be coming from that stairway to literal hell. These terrifying manifestations are believed to be from the accused families or even the convicts themselves doomed to relive the moment that they were sentenced to die over and over again. People also report banging headaches in the courtroom and an absolute sickness to their stomach, keeled over in pain that completely disappears when they leave the room. And actually like, I totally understand that. Out of the entire site, the courtroom is just the place where I just get bad vibes from. I mean, obviously like it's this really big and foreboding room, like you know what went down in there, that's gonna play into it somewhat, but I just get a really bad feeling from that particular area that I don't really get anywhere else. And when I was there last, I did have like a weird experience. So I get migraines. I haven't had one for a few months, but when I do, I usually get them with an aura. So like my vision goes really funny and I'm pretty much written off for the rest of the day. Like if you need me, don't, because I'm gonna be in the dark room for the foreseeable kind of thing. So anyway, we were like on this tour and the courtroom was in darkness, apart from like a few LED candles, like adding a little bit of ambience. And as soon as I sat down in that courtroom, I just started feeling weird. And the weird feeling kept getting weirder. And my vision started to go a bit patchy. Not quite an aura, but just like not right. Kind of giving me that like migraine feeling. I looked up and I just saw this like huge white, almost like a lightning bolt, like flash across the top right of my vision. Like it was right here in my vision. And like, I've had bad migraines before. I've had migraines that last days. I've had mild ones. I've had them with and without auras, but I've never had that happened to me before during a migraine. The tour had only really just started at this point. I was there on this tour because I wanted to get a bit more information for this video. So we were there in the first room. The tour had been going about three minutes. I was pissed. I had just got here and I was about to get written off with a migraine. Absolutely not, was not gonna happen. But obviously with migraines, like there's nothing you can do. If you're gonna get a migraine, like I can stamp my feet and complain and throw a tantrum, but in the end, it's gonna happen. I'm having a migraine. But there was nothing I could do. I couldn't, I was already in a dark room, I guess. But I just planted my feet like really firmly on the floor. I relaxed just like as much as I could. And I just said to myself, this is not happening. 
I'm not doing this right now. And it completely went away. All of the sort of like kaleidoscopic things that were coming into the vision. I only had that lightning bolt bit once, but like all of it just completely went away. The pain, all of it. And I was totally fine for the rest of the tour and the rest of the evening. So yeah, it could have just been a funky version of a migraine, but still a bit weird. Not had that before. Downstairs in the county jail cells, there has also been so much activity reported. There's been a dark figure of a jailer seen walking up the corridor of the cells, looking like he's sort of like doing his rounds and checking in on the prisoners. Apparently he's quite a negative entity that really doesn't like women in that area. Because back in his day, that would have been the men's section of the prison, no girls allowed. So a lot of the time, female staff members will like come out of that area with scratches. Some will have reported the feeling of like unseen hands pushing them. And it's thought to be this spirit telling you to get the hell out of the men's prison, you filthy wench. Visitors and staff have also reported feeling the same sickening feeling, like with that unmistakable awareness that you're being watched. There's also a night cell that's open down there that you can go and walk into, kind of like get a feel for like what it would have been like in there. And this particular cell was the same cell where Yvette Fielding like burst into tears on their most haunted investigation. And it's reported quite a lot that visitors will just like, they'll walk in and just be overcome with emotion as soon as they walk into the cell. Which makes sense, like this would have been where you would have been held if you were awaiting transportation or even like execution. Like it wouldn't have been a particularly great vibe in there. There was one absolutely terrifying story that came out of one of those jail cells though. So before the museum opened as the Galleries of Justice, there were a small group of people given access to explore the building alone. And like they'd all split up at this point, they were just like going around and like looking at different things all on their own. One woman was exploring the main jail cells and decided to enter the end cell, which was where the condemned would have stayed before they were executed. Everything was fine. She was walking around the room, like sort of taking it all in. When all of a sudden the atmosphere changed, the heavy cell door slammed shut. It refused to open. That door was not budging. The thing was this woman had wandered off alone from the group. No one was around to see what had happened and no one was close by to hear her screaming. Eventually some other members of the group finally heard her thinking that an old door just like got caught on the latch and locked itself or something. So they went off to grab the night watchman but no matter what they said or did, nothing could calm this woman down that was in the cell just getting more and more desperate. Obviously like some people get super claustrophobic when they're trapped in somewhere and getting trapped in an old building at night, like in a room that condemned prisoners would spend their final hours. Like I'm sure that would be enough to set anyone off. But that wasn't the reason for this woman. The night watchman came down to the condemned cell, but even his keys weren't unlocking this door. They were trying everything to get this door open and it was not moving. The woman inside was getting more and more hysterical until just as suddenly as it had slammed and locked, the door unlocked itself and opened up as easily as it would opening your own bedroom door. It was quite obvious that the woman was traumatized and when they finally like eventually calmed her down somewhat, she explained what had really happened while she was locked in that cell. When she was looking around, like nothing was really out of place. She hadn't really noticed anything weird. When the door had slammed shut, like obviously it scared her a bit as, as it would anyone. So she was like desperately trying to open the door, like looking around the room to see if there was something she could use to get it open. And it was at that moment that she saw something else in the cell with her sitting on the iron frame of the bed, staring at her. It appeared to be the translucent figure of a woman wearing a white wedding dress. I mean, yeah, okay, no wonder the poor woman was freaked out. Once the entity had apparently got a good look at the woman, it disappeared, the exact moment that the door unlocked itself. The story goes that one of the many condemned who were sentenced to death was a young bride who, consumed with jealousy, had convinced herself that her new husband had a thing for her sister. Okay, he's marrying you, but okay. So she had killed him on their wedding night. She was obviously caught and sentenced to death, so she would have spent her final night on earth in that room. Terrifying. Also, I didn't realize how many women kill their husbands on their wedding night. Like the more research I'm doing for this channel, the more I'm coming across this type of story, which 
is super weird. Why do you think that is? Why is that a thing? So as one of the oldest parts of the jail, the pits are also known as an absolutely terrifying place to be once the sun goes down. I say once the sun goes down, like the pits are underground, so it doesn't really matter if the sun's up or not. Like it's dark as hell down there and there's activity at all hours of the day really. But it has such a bad vibe to it that just entering the area can be enough to trigger panic attacks in some people. On more than one occasion, people that venture down into the pits report feeling extremely sick again and they have to get the hell out of there. But that is not all. People report being touched by unseen hands, they can hear footsteps and even seeing dark dark shadows moving about down there. And the area where the oubliette is, the sheriff's dungeon, that's got a weird vibe to it as well. It's like well down in the caves part, so like right back into medieval times, you'd have basically been locked up in a pitch black cave. It probably had more to do with the fact that you were pretty underground at that point, so you couldn't hear anything, but there's just such a heavy atmosphere down there. It just feels hopeless and dark and just sad. Like really not a positive place to be. When we were there earlier in the year, someone started walking down the steps and must have stopped halfway for like a good, like two minutes. So I heard footsteps and then saw no one and I was convinced I'd just heard a ghost. But then someone came all the way down and I just realized it was probably just them. <laughs> but there have been reports of actual paranormal activity down there as the presence of a young child has been felt down in the caves. People have also report hearing like shuffling sounds and some visitors have claimed that they've felt a tapping on their shoulders when absolutely no one is around. Technology also has a tendency to not work properly down there too, like phones will just quit on you unexpectedly and the lights that are like all installed down there will just switch off. Like there's nothing wrong with them, the bulbs are fine, they just won't work. Even the electricians don't have a clue why they stop working. Just around the corner from the sheriff's dungeon are the dark cells, which have an insanely dark energy to them. People report an intense feeling of being watched with unseen hands like grabbing and pulling you. And even some people saying that they've been attacked by whatever remains down there. And it really does feel ominous down in those dark cells. Like these cells were used as the punishment cells. Like prison was bad enough, but then you've got jailers making your life even more miserable if you don't behave. Not the most fun place to be. The women's section also has a few stories tied to it, although these don't really seem to be as bad. So if you're not handling the energy very well in the place, I mean, first of all, it's a place where people were imprisoned and executed. So not really sure what you were expecting, but also go to the laundry room or the exit. There's apparently been the apparition of a matron seen in the women's cell. Her footsteps have also been heard echoing on the stone floor when there is absolutely no one down there. She's not a negative entity, but she she's probably just like what she was in life. Like she had to manage the female prisoners. She was probably stern, kind of like a no nonsense sort of woman. Do no harm, take no shit kind of girl, I'm gonna guess. And it's not just the cells that have the ghost stories tied to them. Oh no, they are littered throughout this building. The chapel seems to have attracted a particularly negative entity with violent poltergeist activity being recorded, including reports that the large crucifix has been thrown across the room. Even the museum's cafe has been the site of paranormal activity with water jugs being moved across the counter and coffee cups inexplicably moved from one area to another. So really, nowhere is safe with pretty much every room experiencing some type of paranormal activity at all hours of the day. And with such a long and miserable history, it completely makes sense that Nottinghamshire's Shire Hall and County Jail have so many ghost stories attached to it. As it's now open to the public as a museum, you can walk around and take that very same journey that condemned criminals would have made from the courtroom to the gallows. So it's possible that you may even come across some of those that continue to roam long after their death. But what do you think? Have you ever visited the National Justice Museum and felt or seen something there? Please let me know your thoughts down below. I absolutely love reading other people's ghostly experiences. I've been a few times over the years and while I didn't really like see or hear anything out of the ordinary, other than those footsteps that turned out to be a guy and the weird migraine thing, it does really have an uncomfortable, oppressive atmosphere in places. You really do get the feeling that you're not alone and it definitely does feel heavier in some areas compared to others. So I can completely understand why it's thought to be one of the most haunted buildings in the UK. I mean, you only have to do a search on YouTube and you will find hours and hours of paranormal investigations done on the place. So let me know. If you enjoyed this story, I would be forever grateful if you would hit that like button for me and I would love to see you back here for another story. So I don't know, 
If you fancy it, you might want to subscribe. And if there are any other haunted places or stories that you would like me to cover, please do let me know. I'm always up for learning about new spooky spooky places. But that is all from me today. I cannot wait to chat with you more tomorrow. So until next time, sleep safe. For usually a day or two, but it could have been up to a week on a bread, bread of diet and water. Ugh.